Welcome to Physics Next Book. In this video, we shall discuss four vectors, what they are, how they behave, etc. Of course, with some examples. So let's begin with what four vectors are in general. To properly define four vectors, one needs to take the differential geometry route, which pure mathematicians and even most professional relativists would prefer. But I'm guessing you're not one of them. So we would like to understand four vectors using the Lorentz transformation equations. These are four equations that connect the two sets of space-time coordinates of a given event P as measured in two different inertial frames. Hopefully you already know what the symbols mean mathematically and physically. If not, well, you can watch a video I posted a few days back. The link is in the card and description. In that video, we have explained how these four Lorentz transformation equations can be dressed up as a matrix equation where the four values 0, 1, 2 and 3 of the indices mu and nu correspond to time ct and xyz the spatial coordinates respectively. Now Lorentz transformation equation in this matrix form can be thought of as the benchmark for four vectors in special relativity in the sense that any four component object that transforms like x mu under Lorentz transformation is a four vector. What do we mean by transform like? Measurement of this four component object by the observers in two different inertial frames S1 and S2 will take two different sets of values which will be related by the same Lorentz transformation matrix that relates the two sets of space-time coordinates of S1 and S2 frames. Now, a random four vector like a mu works fine for a formal definition, but what we really need is some concrete examples. So let's see. We talked about the event P and its space-time coordinates x mu in our S1 frame. Now take a second event Q, infinitesimally close to P, that is very close to P. Being so close to P, the space-time coordinates of Q will differ only slightly. So those will be x mu plus dx mu. The small difference dx mu between their space-time coordinates are c dt along r time direction and dx dy and dz along r3 spatial directions. dx mu is referred to as the space-time coordinate differential that we observers in S1 frame measure. Now in a different inertial frame S2, the same events P and Q will have a different set of space-time coordinates, the primed ones. The corresponding coordinate differential between P and Q will of course be dx prime mu, measured by observers in S2 frame. Can we calculate dx prime mu using our measurements of dx mu? Quite easily. We already know how the primed and unprimed coordinates of an event in S1 and S2 frames are related by the Lorentz transformations, right? Now all the entries in the Lorentz matrix lambda are either 1 or 0 or made of the constant relative velocity beta which is b by c that is velocity in units of light speed between s1 and s2 frames. So lambda is a constant matrix. It remains the same at event p and at event q. In fact at any other event for that matter. So we can write the Lorentz transformation equations once for the event p and also for the event q and then take the difference. This could have been a lot of work if we were to work with separate equations for each components like ct, x, y, z, etc. But thankfully, we can use the matrix equation and do it in one go. From the results, we can readily see that the coordinate differentials in S1 and S2 relate to each other just like the space-time coordinates themselves did. They are obviously four component objects, so we got ourselves a four vector. This looks almost trivial, right? It certainly does if you are familiar with calculus. You will immediately say we have just taken a differential of the Lorentz transformation equation. Quite true, but sometimes it is good to remind ourselves what taking differentials physically mean. Okay, moving on to the second example. Think of a massive particle moving around in space-time. If the two events P and Q happen to be on its space-time trajectory, also known as the world line, then the quantity dx mu d tau represents a tangent to this world line at the event P. dx mu here is obviously the space-time coordinate differential between events P and Q. We have already discussed this. d tau is the time interval between events P and Q, but not the one shown by the observer's clock, that is our clock. Rather, it is shown by a clock attached to that massive particle. 
formerly known as the proper time interval. We have discussed what is proper time, what is a world line, how it is mathematically represented, why its tangent is dx mu d tau, all of that in earlier videos in our channel. You may want to check them out. The links are in the description as usual. Anyway, the dx mu in the dx mu d tau is already a 4 vector. We discussed that, right? Down below, the infinitesimal proper time interval d tau is a Lorentz scalar or Lorentz invariant, meaning its value remains the same in all inertial frames. Why? Because c square d tau square, the speed of light squared times the proper time interval squared between p and q, is numerically equal to the space time interval d a square between them, that is between p and q. And space time interval is invariant under Lorentz transformation. It's like relativity 101, right? So the upper bit transforms like a 4 vector and the lower bit does not transform at all, it just goes for a ride, giving an overall 4 vector again. We use the symbol u mu for it and call it the 4 velocity of the particle since it is very closely related to the 3 dimensional velocity vector of the particle but has 4 components instead. Certain aspects of this 4 velocity will blow your mind. There is a dedicated video on it in this channel, link is in the description as usual. Ok, let's see yet another example. This one is simple enough to get but has a controversy attached to it for quite some time. Just multiply the rest mass of the particle to its 4 velocity we just discussed. What you will get is called the momentum 4 vector, 4 momentum in short, usually denoted by p mu. The rest mass of the particle is a scalar under Lorentz transformation, so I hope it is quite obvious to you why 4 momentum also is a 4 vector. So that's it for today. We have seen enough examples of 4 vectors for one video. Hopefully it was worth your time. See you in the next one. Oh, and about the controversy bit, it is about the velocity dependence of mass and it comes from this definition of 4 momentum. We shall talk about it in the next video, so you know what to do. See you around. Bye bye.